If she couldn't have any fun, nobody else was going to have any fun either. She came to embody all the things that were disliked about the 19th century. But behind the public face, the other Vicky, ruthlessly ambitious. She had a desperate eagerness for power. Bad tempers. Victoria's view was that it's better to be wicked than it is to be weak. Blooded. Queen Victoria loved sex. She had quite a raucous personality. A woman of surprises. Welcome to the secret life of Queen Victoria. <laughs> Victoria, the glare that screams, we are not amused. People think of Queen Victoria, they think of the fat old lady in black, dry and dreary and, and just miserable. She's like this force that blocks out the light, blocks out humour, blocks out pleasure. But don't be fooled by the picture. Here's another one. <laughs> She was a deeply passionate woman. She was a woman of great appetites, a woman who loved dancing, who loved music, who loved the theater, who loved popular entertainment. She loved to laugh. She loved to have fun. She, she had great joy de vivre. She's a sprite, barely five feet in her socks, who reigned over the British Empire from 1837 to 1901. She ruled the most powerful, the most feared, and the richest country in the world. But Victoria only got the job by default, because the men in her family were too drunk or too busy with their mistresses to produce any legitimate heirs. She's just 18 when the crown falls at her feet. Victoria was woken up one morning with the news that her uncle had died in the night and that she was now the queen. Here was independence, here was freedom, and here was power, and she had a desperate eagerness for power. It's the best day of her life. At last, she's out from under the thumb of Mommy Dearest. For much of her childhood, she'd been kept a virtual prisoner. I mean, she'd never really known her father, and her mother kept her... I mean, really in a state of confinement. She had to sleep in her mother's bedroom and was forbidden to play outside or even go up and down stairs by herself. She had such a strange, warped upbringing that it's amazing that she survived at all. June 20th, 1837, day one of her reign. Miss Vicky shows she's a take charge kind of gal. She says to her mother, I'm going in alone. You are going to wait outside. This is my business now. She can do what she likes, has more money than Oprah, and wants for nothing except a one true love. Until now, all her affections have been lavished on her dog, Dash. Time to trade up to her husband. Victoria had many admirers. They followed her carriage. They threw proposals into her carriage at the coronation. They tried to get into her box at the opera. She was incredibly sought after. What's a young queen to do? Me, a perky monarch with an empire and loads of palaces. You, a sturdy young man from a good family. Must love dogs. She's in a very unusual position because there are rules about who she can marry. Potential suitors are rounded up, including the future Tsar of Russia and the future King of the Netherlands. But the smart money is on Prince Albert of Germany. They're first cousins, but never mind. Royal inbreeding is par for the course. Well, the first time Albert and Victoria met, it was rather like an internet date gone wrong. He fell asleep in his plate at her birthday ball. She thought he was dry and dreary, and he thought she was silly and frivolous. But the next time, it's different. Maybe it's the trousers. And she writes in her diary that Albert is wearing white cashmere breeches with nothing on underneath them. 
And she fell utterly in love with him and proposed marriage to him five days later. They're married in the chapel at St James's Palace. And then it's off to Windsor Castle for a romp in the royal bedchamber. One of the ideas that we have received about Queen Victoria is that she had a problematic attitude to sex, and she was not like this at all. She was very enthusiastic about getting into bed with Albert. <laughs> letter from Victoria about the wedding night gushes like a romance novel. We kissed again and again. It was bliss beyond belief. Was she writing to her BFF? Nope. The letter went, OMG, to Lord Melbourne, the Prime Minister. Can you imagine Queen Elizabeth II um, waking up after her first night with, uh, with the Duke of Edinburgh and writing to Churchill in those sort of terms? So, forget the notion that Victorians were a repressed lot of cocoa-sipping prudes. It's nonsense. They loved their smutty publications. There was a fantastic publication called The Pearl, a monthly journal of facetiae and voluptuous reading. You could indulge yourself with stories like Sport Among the She-Noodles or Lady Pokingham or They All Do It. And what goes with dirty books? Dirty pictures. Look at that. They're quite shocking. She might be our great-great-grandmother, uh, mightn't she? Yours or mine? Why not? Yeah. And here we are, this, this is something that... You know, this is a little different. We're getting into rather different sort of territory here, something much more explicit. So these are these repressed, reticent Victorians that we hear so much about. Here they are, having sex on camera, you know, showing their, their fleshy parts and their pubic hair, you know, mocking us, really, for thinking of them in this way. When Victoria was crowned Queen of England in 1837, she got the keys to a dozen royal palaces. But she hated most of them. So hubby Albert made them a love shack. Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. At first glance, a perfect picture of decorum. This is a public face of Albert and Victoria. This is what they wanted us to see. It's the fine, upstanding family here. And this, here we have the Queen next to her son. We have Albert next to the daughters. And they are the quiet, domestic, loving, rather humble family. It's completely unlike the usual royal portrait, very stiff, very formal. Albert and Victoria are showing themselves as a devoted couple, a devoted family, and this is their way of setting an example to the nation. But up here in the private rooms, it's more like the Playboy Mansion, where caution and clothing are tossed aside. So the private life was really very different to the public. This is a painting that Victoria gave to Albert on his birthday, and it's of these nymphs who are preparing to go bathe, whereas King Roderick is just peeking at them from just behind the bushes there. And this is a painting that they had right in front of their double desks, where they sat and worked on their papers and looked up at that. No surprise, it's not long before Victoria gets pregnant. And out <laughs> pops Victoria Junior, future Empress of Germany. Albert, later King Edward VII, soon follows. And then Alice, Alfred, Helena, Louise, Arthur, Leopold and Beatrice. Nine kids in 15 years. She's churning them out like an assembly line. It's enough to make Brad and Angelina green with envy. But when Mom and Dad get the urge, kids can get in the way. Well, this is Albert and Victoria's actual bed in Osborne House, and they were famously devoted. She adored him. She wrote in the early days that he, she'd watch him shave, and he helped her put on her stockings, and they loved to be alone. And Albert made his own system to ensure they were going to be alone. And let me show you. So Albert created this locking system that meant he could lock the door without leaving the bed. So he pulled at the lever here and it connected to a whole system of pulleys and wires. So the wire went from that spool there, over there, down to here. So you'd pull the lever and the bolt would lock. 
A queen is expected to produce heirs, but that doesn't mean she has to like them. Even though Victoria had nine children, they were eh. She wasn't that fond of very young babies who she thought were frog-like and rather unattractive, but she absolutely loved the process of making them. We can certainly say that. Loved sex, hated the consequences. <laughs> When her uncle Leopold writes to congratulate her on being pregnant, again, she writes back... I don't think you realise how hard it is, Uncle Leopold, for us to go through this very often. And she said, if I have a nasty girl at the end of all my plagues, I shall drown it. Victoria's no mother of the year. She browbeats Bertie, her eldest son and heir to the throne. She said that he didn't have a proper chin, that his lips were too large. She described his birthday, his upcoming birthday, as a bitter day. She found him disappointing, unwilling to learn, a bit stupid, a bit dull. A domestic scene is painted to enhance the royal image as one big happy family. But notice it's Albert down on the floor playing with the little treasures. No confusing who wears the pants in this family. <laughs> She may have said in the wedding ceremony she was going to obey him, but actually when it came down to it, she was the queen and he would have to deal with that. And the role that she carved out for him was sort of one of an administrative assistant. Organising a blotting paper, making sure that the ink from her signature doesn't run on the paper, because that's what Albert spent a lot of his time doing. So Serene Highness has door slamming rows with Albert. She was so passionate, she would fly into rages and he would be very passive aggressive and cold. He would just try to disengage and she would just keep at him. Victoria's view was that it's better to be wicked than it is to be weak. <laughs> she also has the cultural tastes of a commoner. She'd blow off the opera any day for lion tamers, tightrope walkers, or even a freak show. She arranged meetings with figures like Tom Thumb, who was a performing dwarf. He would dress up as Napoleon, he would sing, he would dress up as Cupid and fire arrows into the audience. She was delighted by him. England, 1860. In the palaces of Queen Victoria and Albert, the machinery of royal living seems to move with impeccable splendor. But appearances mask some dirty little secrets. Secret number one, squalor. The royal palaces are filthy. There were rats and cockroaches scuttling around these places. They stank. There were parts of Windsor Castle that were said to be almost uninhabitable because of the mephitic odours that billowed up from these pipes. Secret number two, waste. The palaces are bleeding red ink. Dinners were laid out for people who never came. The servants are clocking off whenever they want. They're going AWOL. They're smoking and they're drinking on, their, on the job. Nobody can find them when they need them. The palaces were chaotic. Food disappeared, the people were hiding in the palaces. Secret number three, Bertie. Victoria and Albert's eldest son and heir is 20 now and out whoring and hell-raising. Bertie was a great trial to both of them. He was an irresponsible person. He was a person who involved himself in scandal with unsuitable women. But no worries, Albert tackles all three with Germanic zeal. He cleans up the filth, trims the fat, and turns to the trouble with Bertie. Prince Albert goes up to Cambridge, where Bertie is, in, is enrolled at school, and it's British weather. It's damp and it's yucky out, and Prince Albert catches a terrible cold that develops into a high fever. Two weeks later, in December 1861, Albert dies of what doctors suspect is typhoid fever. He's only 42. Victoria was desperate for him to cling on to life, but he didn't, and he went. And she was absolutely broken in that moment. Victoria goes woof, right down into the deepest, blackest mourning. And Victoria's grief takes a bizarre turn. One of the things that appears 
sort of slightly freakish and excessive to us about Victoria's morning is the way that she tried to keep Albert alive. All of his chambers were kept as they were at the moment of his death. She would get the servants to bring hot water up to those rooms, even though there was nobody there to use it. And there's something heartbreaking about that, and also something a bit weird. And it gets creepier. She has a plaster cast made of Albert's cold, dead hand. Every night, she sleeps in their bed with articles of his clothing, and maybe the hand. She embarks upon increasingly grandiose schemes to build a mausoleum, to build a memorial for him. And statues, scores of them, erected all over Britain and the Empire. In Hyde Park, you've got the Albert Memorial, where a golden effigy of him sits encased in this um, amazing construction. She wanted to fill the world with images of him. Victoria retreats to Osborne House for four years. She hides from the world, refusing to make public appearances or to attend to affairs of state. The press circulates rumors that she's barking mad. One wag posts a sign on the gates of Buckingham Palace. Premises for rent. Victoria's mourning the public began to feel was far too excessive. After years, they were like, snap out of it, because it was, it was enough already. Victoria seems to have lost interest in everything, except the buffet table. It's extraordinary if you read about what she's eating. Some of the ladies in waiting are saying things like, it's no wonder the Queen's not very well. You should have seen what she put away last, last night. She wolfs it down like a shipwreck survivor, routinely polishing off a six-course meal in less than half an hour. People really do have the wrong idea about Victoria. They think that she was always the shape of a Christmas pudding. When she was 18 and she became queen, you would be amazed how tiny and slender she was. I'm 26 inches around the waist, but that's nothing compared with Victoria. She was an extraordinary 20. But it wasn't going to stay that way. She had nine children, she had a lot of pudding, and by the time she's about 40, she's gone up a size or two. These are a genuine pair of her pants. It's brilliant to be this close to something that touched her skin. And we know that they're hers because there's a little VR for Victoria Regina and a little crown. They're enormous. <laughs> they're really huge. The waist now, the measurement is 38 inches. But that's not the end of the story. Albert dies, she goes into mourning, she comforts, eats, and towards the end of her life, well, she's gone up again. This is a replica of a pair she wore in later life. Now the waist is 56 inches. Certainly by now, she appears to be as wide as she is tall. Clearly, she needs an intervention. But how do you get a queen to snap out of it? By calling in John Brown, a favourite servant from her Scottish estate. He looks good in a kilt and has a penchant for whiskey and plain talk. John Brown was not afraid of her. He was not cowed by Her Majesty. And yet he still knew how to flirt with her and how to cajole her. He would um, accompany her on her pony. He would do things like carry her cloak and quite sort of innocuous things, but she obviously liked having him around. Before you know it, she's calling him Johnny and making schoolgirl sketches of the brawny Highlander. And rumors are flying. <laughs> Vicky and Johnny are sharing more than pony rides. I mean, she addressed him as darling in private correspondence. This is a level of intimacy that no other person other than Albert ever enjoyed with her. The other servants start calling the Queen Mrs. Brown behind her back while he spikes her tea with whiskey, and she loves it. She pursued this relationship to the embarrassment of the people around her, to the disapproval of her own children. The, the children actually called him mother's lover. Perhaps it was a joke, perhaps it wasn't, who knows? Another rumour has it that Victoria believed the spirit of Albert had gone into John Brown's body. And so it wasn't really cheating, was it? 
she did believe in seances, and she did try to commune with Albert's spirit but never in a million years would she have cheated on, on the ghost of Albert with John Brown. So, were they doing it or not? We'll never know for sure. 1897. The British Empire covers one quarter of the planet, and Queen Victoria has reigned over it for 60 years. England throws a huge party to celebrate her Diamond Jubilee. Everything was jubilee themed that year, from plates to tablecloths to slippers to soap boxes to match boxes. 78 year old Victoria presides over it all, but she's waiting for the real party to begin. Towards the end of her life, she is impatient for death. She wants to die because she's absolutely convinced that when she dies, she's going to see Albert on the other side of the veil. Victoria gets her wish. She dies in January 1901, 39 years after Albert's death. But when she's reunited with him, she's got some explaining to do. Victoria had left strict instructions on what she wanted placed inside her coffin. There's the marble cast of Albert's hand, of course, but he's got company. Scandalously, unbeknownst to her family, she had given private instructions to her personal physician to include items from her beloved John Brown. His framed photograph, which they wrapped in tissue. A packet of letters from John Brown to Victoria. And a lock of his hair. All of which the doctor discreetly concealed with a posy so that when members of the royal family came to pay their final respects to the queen, they wouldn't notice them. Yes, Victoria had her secrets right till the end. I would have loved to have met Victoria because, you know, I would have loved to have seen the person behind the inherited image. We've sort of frozen her in time, and instead of this young, bubbly, effervescent young woman, which is how she started, we've frozen her in time as the old woman who was a terrible prude. And I think it's sad today that people think that she's this sort of dour, humorless, black-clad figure, because she wasn't always. She used to be a lively young girl who loved dancing and laughing and Albert. 